Well, good morning, everyone. Still got some folks making their way in here, so give, give them a little bit of time to do that. In the past couple of weeks, we've started off service with a song, um, but I was thinking when I was choosing uh, the songs to start service with uh, this past week, um, well, first, I do want to say this. I'm so glad that you all are here this morning, um, and if, if this is your first time here, um, we're happy that you you chose to be with us uh, today. Um, and, and, and in saying that, I'll say this. You know, like, we all come to this building, um, and we may have brought some baggage with us. Um, you know, there's people who have experienced loss, and today th you're bringing a little bit of grief with you this morning, and or or you're angry, and you're bringing that anger with you this morning. Um, but what's really cool is God tells us to, to, to bring it and, and put it at the foot of the cross. Um, and, that's, and that's really cool. That's really, really cool. Let's all stand up this morning and uh, invite, invite Jesus uh, here with us. All who are thirsty all who are we come to the fountain dip your heart in the stream of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as he cries out to Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. That's why we praise Him, that's why we sing, 
That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Because he gave his everything. Because he gave his everything. He came to live, to live, live again in us. He came to be, to be our conquering king and friend. He came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, to go prepare a place for us, and that's why we praise Him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this King, because He gave His everything, because He gave His everything. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That's why we praise Him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our every. That's why we bow down and worship this King, because He gave His everything, because He gave His everything. That's why we offer Him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this King. Because He gave His everything. Because He gave His everything. Hey, Beth, you can have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Just a couple things. Um, we are looking for a website graphics designer. Um, there's an application process for that, too. There was a link set out this past week and probably one this coming week for that position. The good thing about it is, like, in six months, your salary doubles, and in a year, it triples, um, but it starts at zero. So this is a... but. Um, the blessings we receive from serving. We talked about, with our, that, talked about that with our children this morning, the uh, blessings that we receive um, when we give and when we serve uh, are countless. Uh, a couple other things. Our 20s and 30s group, um, which is really active, and, and it's great to see that group uh, and all that they're doing. They have a game night here at um, 6 o'clock on October the 6th. Uh, there will be pizza and desserts and... Um, 20s, 30s, 50s, 60s, if you want to show up for some pizza, just go ahead. Um, yeah, older people, let those younger ones try to fight us off, and we'll see who's the toughest. Uh, the Gifted Ministry is having a karaoke and limbo night on uh, Saturday, October the 7th, and they are looking for food and drink donations and volunteers uh, that will come in and help with that. Uh, also, October 15th, uh, is our uh, praise and worship night with our children and youth. Area churches are coming here for that, um, and all are invited to that. There's also food afterwards, too. Uh, and uh, Cole and Macy Weist. Are Cole and Macy around? Are they here? Can they come up? We're going to call you out. Cole and Macy. Cole and Macy Weiss, they're working their way um, 
up front here, they, uh, they want to place membership with us. And you can just come on up here. They want to place membership with us. And for some reason, they love us and they want to spend some more time with us. And that's awesome. Uh, and I hope I'm, I'm allowed to say about a baby coming up, right? Okay, so um, they're expecting baby Wyatt too, which is really exciting. Was that casual enough? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but they're expecting baby Wyatt too. And um, we're just excited that you wanna place membership with us and, and serve with us. Um, let's all pray together. Father, we are so grateful to you for uh, the Hunter Hills Church, for our brothers and sisters in Christ here. And Father, we worship you and thank you that our brother and sister Cole and Macy have decided to join us um, in serving you and serving each other and serving our community. Um, and Father, we ask your richest blessing to be upon them. Thank you for bringing them to us and God, we ask a special blessing upon baby Wyatt as um, he grows and develops and help him to be healthy, help him to be strong and, um, and blessed his entire life. And God, we thank you for this time of worship that we can remember Jesus, that we can hear from your word, that we can lift up songs of praise to you, God. Father, you are worthy of our praise and we are so grateful to you, Father, for the way that you love us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. They're my good friends, so I'm really happy they're staying with us, too. Let's all stand up and uh, continue singing together. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome. Good morning, church. It's 
it seems that the uh, church feels uh, more alive than it than it has in a long time. Certainly, uh, it, it feels wonderful. We're you know far beyond the pandemic, and and obviously it, it also feels like it's uh, growing. And we had some good evidence of that uh, just a moment ago, introducing some new members. So. Um, Morgan and I uh, actually wrote out a couple of prayers uh, to read uh, during this communion time. And I'd like to remind you guys that it's not a competition, um, especially because Morgan's is a little better than mine. So bear with me. I actually find, find it a little bit more difficult to read through these, so, so forgive the uh, stumbling over words. So if you guys will, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the ability to take communion together as a church family in your presence. During this season, I'd like to ask that you be with our staff. Thank you for their leadership and determination. Please continue to guide them as they teach and as they guide our church. We appreciate the opportunity to learn from them and to serve alongside them. Lord, we ask that you bless our congregation, members and visitors. Help our church family to grow in our authenticity and our vulnerability with you as well as with each other. Please deepen our relationships with each other as we seek to deepen our relationship with you. Help our church to be welcoming to new members and visitors and help guide us in a way to make all who come through those doors feel included. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice and his example. Please guide us into deeper reflection on him during our time of communion. And finally, thank you for the church, not just the physical building, but the ability to meet in person on a weekly basis. We love to be in your presence with your people singing praises. Thank you for Hunter Hills. In your son's name we pray, amen. Dear Lord, thank you for the freedom to gather and worship you. Thank you for the sacrament of communion. Please guide our relationships in this church. Please, please allow us to be open with one another in order to heal and encourage. Please help us to aid one another and be vigilant to the needs of others. Please facilitate friendships that draw us closer to you. Please heal the strained relationships, whether that be in friendships, marriages, families, or with our children. Please allow our children to see us loving and serving and feel the love and acceptance emanating from us. Please allow your love to pour into our children so they feel loved, seen, and at home with us. Please help us lead through example and love. Thank you for those of us blessed with health. Please allow us not to take it for granted and to use it to serve you in your church. Please give us spiritual health. Please draw us closer to you. Draw us into prayer, worship, biblical understanding, and service to the church's needs. Please grow and develop the fruits of the Spirit in us and weed out our vices. Please let us be a loving refuge for the world. Please allow us to nurture those in need. Please raise the children to love you and have a deep faith. Bless Will and Brittany, our elders, and Stephen, Paige, Monet, and Abby with guidance as they lead the congregation. Thank you for every soul here. Allow us to be transformed by your body and blood. Amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God. 
God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Before he does that, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss. We have children at the ages of three years old to kindergarten. Uh, we have a special time of first worship prepared uh, just for them. A time of learning, a time of, of singing, I'm sure, uh, and growing, growing more to be like Jesus. So they can exit back uh, those double doors and, and hang a left. And uh, somebody should be there. I don't know. I think it is left. Somebody will be there to greet them, though. There we go. Check. There we go. Mm, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, Hunter Hills family, and welcome to all of you who are visiting with us. If you have not gone out and gotten your free coffee mug, we encourage you to get the free coffee mug. I know what you're thinking. I already have too many coffee mugs. They're literally spilling out of my cabinets. But you know you want another one, because that's just the way we are. We cannot have too many coffee mugs. So please go get that as our gift to you. Before we open the scriptures together, I just want to say a brief word about this night of praise, October 15th. One of the best parts of Camp Refuge the past several years is watching God stir our children and youth up in their love for praising God in song. And we couldn't wait till next year. Um, every year it gets better and better. And so we wanted to uh, host it here. And so we've got Children's and Youth Ministries from Vaughn Park, Landmark, Inner City, and Hunter Hills coming here to, um, to sing praise. And I want you guys to be able to experience that. So please make plans to be here October 15th, 4 p.m. To, uh, to see what God is doing among our children and youth, not just at Hunter Hills, but across this region. Uh, so go ahead and make plans to be there. Contrary to popular belief about our youth these days, our young people really are growing in their love for God. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see God breathe a, a fresh uh, grace and a fresh strength over his church through our young people. Uh, and I'm excited to experience that. For our time in the scriptures this morning, this time that we set aside at each gathering to hear what God speaks through his holy scripture. Did you know the Bible is called Holy Scripture in Romans chapter 1? Didn't know that until this last year. I thought that's just something high church people said. They called it Holy Scripture. And I was like, I don't know about that. It's right there. Paul in Romans 1 calls it Holy Scripture, and we get to open it up. 
and we get to read and, and try our best to understand. So for our time in Holy Scripture, we're going to be meditating together on 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. Let's read that, and, uh, and then we will pray together. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we are here to exalt you, to glorify you, to adore you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons and three in one. We ask you now to give us clarity in our understanding of your Son as we seek to glorify him as the Word who was with God in the beginning and was God. We glorify him as the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us and made you known to us in whom all your fullness was pleased to dwell bodily, the head of all rule and authority, your Son, through whom you have spoken your definitive word, whom you appointed the heir of all things, through whom you created the world, the radiance of your glory and the exact imprint of your nature, who upholds all things by the word of his power. Your Son incarnate, Emmanuel, who was called on earth Jesus of Nazareth, who was worshipped at his birth, who is the promised Messiah and King, he who said before Abraham was, I am, who was called by his disciple Thomas, my Lord and my God, who was hated by the Pharisees because he made himself equal to God, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ is your son who has truly come in the flesh, truly the son of God. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to us, Father, but you have revealed this to us by your spirit. Help us to glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we read and think about your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. As you just heard in the reading of our text this morning, we're talking about doctrine. John says there are liars, a.k.a. antichrists, who deny that Jesus is the Christ. And then he says they deny the Father and the Son. Is John being too harsh by calling these folks antichrist? Is it really so serious to deny that Jesus is the Christ, to deny that he is the son of, of the Father? Some of you, depending on how you were brought up, might have a visceral reaction to that kind of a statement. Maybe you grew up in a setting where people were treated like antichrist just for asking questions. Or maybe someone wanted to have communion on a Wednesday night 
and the church wanted to excommunicate them like an antichrist. And if, if that was your upbringing, that in order to be brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to agree on everything, then maybe a text like this is difficult because you've swung too far the other direction. And now you don't think we have to agree on anything. I want to introduce you to a tool that has been very helpful for me over the last many years um, in thinking about things like this. Uh, I think it is accurate, I think it is biblical, and I hope that it will help you as well. It's called theological triage. Triage is a word you hear in the emergency room, isn't it? It's that process of determining what is the most serious case. So if I find my way into an emergency room with a sprained ankle, and I've been there for an hour, and I'm like, what's taking so long? And they were like, well, somebody came in who was in a serious car accident just you know, as you were coming in, and that's more important. We triaged that. We put that ahead of you. It's more serious. Theological triage is the process of determining how important, how central, how vital certain doctrines are. And some doctrines are more important, more central than other doctrines. Let me give you an example. Do you think it's more important, the doctrine that God exists? Do you think that's more or less important than the doctrine that says uh, Christ will reign a thousand years after his return on earth? One of those is more central to the whole thing, isn't it? And the other one's like, well, we've been fighting about that for a long time, so who knows? Some are more important than others. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as a first importance what I received that Christ died for your sins and was raised on the third day. He didn't go to Corinth and immediately start talking about uh, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. He took what was most important and he put it first. And so we see Paul triaging his teaching. And I particularly like this pyramid here. At the top of the pyramid are first order doctrines. These are doctrines that all Christians must agree on. We can debate what those are, but I'm just giving you sort of a map to, to think by. Um, I'll give you an example. If you've been taught, like this is not just if, you're, if you've never been taught, but if you've been taught that Christ was raised from the dead and you fail to confess and believe that Christ was raised from the dead, you are holding to a non-Christian doctrine. That's a doctrine of another faith, not the Christian faith. Second order doctrines are those that Christians often disagree on, but the disagreement is over something so important that it's really hard to do church together. You understand? I'm not going to give you an example of this, all right? Uh, but I think you can use your imagination here. Um, there is a reason we have brothers and sisters in Christ who go to other churches. Because there are some things we have to agree on just to function. That's second order doctrine. Third order doctrine are those things we can agree, disagree. It does not matter. It does not affect the functioning of the church. Uh, the classic example here is when is the thousand year reign? What is the thousand year reign? Nobody knows. Some people think they know. I don't know. Not important that we agree on that. Important doctrine yeah, just not that important that we agree on that, and we can function without that. Now, here's the interesting part. Churches can go to one of two extremes. One extreme is to say every doctrine is first order. If we disagree on the tiniest little thing, there are no tiny things. <laughs> that's, what, that's what these churches say. There are no tiny things. Someone put it to me, uh, doctrine is like a tapestry. If you pull at one tiny thread, you unravel the whole thing. And I thought, that's a very fragile tapestry. <laughs> if one little thread is going to undo the entire thing. And under that system, the only true Christians can be the most skilled theologians. But then there is the other extreme, which is to say... Every doctrine is third-order doctrine. 
We don't have to agree on anything. Jesus is divine or not, doesn't matter. God is three in one or just one in one, doesn't matter. The gospel, if you believe it, that's fine, but it doesn't really matter. We don't need to agree on that. This extreme doesn't even think there's a tapestry at all worth preserving. Well, my guess is that most of us here this morning want to exist somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. Not every doctrine is a salvation issue, a first order issue, but there are some doctrines that are not every issue. Not every doctrine is a third order issue. There are some things that are important. As we were taking communion, it just uh, it came over me all of a sudden. The divinity of Christ is why Christ is dead. That's why he died. They hated him for making himself equal. He was willing to die for that. What did the early church suffer and die for? Was it not that Jesus is God and he was raised from the dead? They, so I'm just saying, if in heaven you talk to a saint from the third century who died for their faith and you said, ah, the divinity of Christ, whatever, whatever. They're going to be very offended. <laughs> like They gave their life for that doctrine. So not every doctrine is, is third order. And I think this way of thinking about doctrine, it helps us to avoid these two extremes. Like I said, where does each doctrine fall in this is a matter of, of debate. But the reason we're talking about it is because our text this morning, which like I said last week, I didn't come here with something, an agenda to say a thing. I just opened the Bible and I think this is what it said and now I'm here to just report on what I found. It talks in the starkest terms possible about a first order doctrine. Let's look at the text. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So this church had heard that the Antichrist was coming. I don't know how the word Antichrist doesn't show up uh, anywhere but in the writings of John. So I don't know, um, and not in the gospel. So I don't know how they heard this, but they expected that in the last hour, the Antichrist was coming. In 1 John 4, John talks about the spirit of the Antichrist, where he contrasts the spirit of the Antichrist with the spirit of God. The spirit of the Antichrist, though, John tells us here, is at work in more than just one Antichrist. There are many Antichrists. And John said this is evidence that it's the last hour. Now, we're reading this 2,000 years later and thinking, that's a very long hour. But this tracks with what we've seen so far. Jesus is that rising sun. The light of the dawn is already shining, and the darkness is now fading away. This is what he's getting at. A new age has dawned. And it makes sense that the Antichrist is evidence of the last hour because Christ is evidence of the last hour. And of course, when Christ comes to the world to build his kingdom, the Antichrist is going to fight against that kingdom. And so this makes sense. Then John says, there were people in our church who were Antichrists, and we didn't know it. Then they left, and then we knew it. Now, are you curious about why John calls this particular group Antichrists? Let's keep reading. Verse 22, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. Whoever denies the Father and the Son. Let's look at 1 John 4, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh has come in the flesh, was once not in the flesh, but has come in the flesh, is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. One more, Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. 
those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now you put all these verses together. What is the work of the antichrist? Why does John call these folks antichrist? It's because one, they deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny that Jesus is the Messiah. Two, they deny the Father and the Son, whatever that means. And then three, they do not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And that's just the most obvious definition of Antichrist. If you read the book as a whole, more details begin to emerge. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 24. John writes, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Does that, does that help you? Um, does that call your attention to anything? That which you heard from the beginning. Hold that in your head. Let it abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. What is the antidote to the Antichrist? What is the antidote to the teaching of the Antichrist? John says it is to let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, remain there. Don't shift, don't waver from that which you heard in the beginning. And that reminds us of 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Because this is the first thing John says in this letter. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest to us, and we have seen it, and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So what is John telling the church here? He's telling them what the Antichrists are teaching you is contrary to that which you heard from the beginning. And what did they hear from the beginning? He just told us. They heard about him who is from the beginning, who was with the Father in the beginning, who was God, who is eternal life. We're talking about the Son, specifically that the Son was with the Father in the beginning without flesh, and then the Son came in the flesh. In short, we're talking about the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. And the spirit of the Antichrist does not confess that Jesus is God and man, and therefore the Antichrist do not confess that Jesus is God and man. And John says they were among us, but they were never really of us. Then John turns his attention away from the Antichrist, and he begins to talk to the Christians and here's where it gets fascinating. This is what he says. After all that, this is what he says to the Christians. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. You have been anointed by the Holy One. This is John's way of saying, you have the Holy Spirit. This is what the Antichrists are saying. They say it by the spirit of the Antichrist, but you have the Holy Spirit. Remember we read in 1 John 4 and verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God because that comes from the Spirit of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. In other words, anyone who teaches you that Jesus came in the flesh was moved to teach that by the Holy Spirit. And anyone who teaches that he was not coming, he did not come in the flesh, and he is not the Son of the Father, that person is moved to say that by the Spirit of the Antichrist. And this sounds a lot like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. 
Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. As strange as this might sound to modern ears, this is the teaching of Scripture. If you say, not, he's not talking about just the mouth, all right? An antichrist can lie and say out loud whatever they want to say. He's saying whoever says it in their heart and their mind, whoever confesses it, whoever believes it, whoever takes it as truth, if you can say with your heart and your mind, Jesus is Lord, that is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. All right, I know that was quite a trick, but this is what John is saying. This is the point. If you can confess the Lordship, the divinity and the humanity of Christ, that is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. And therefore, if you do not confess it, even though you understand, even though you've been taught, but you still don't confess the divinity and the humanity and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that is evidence that you do not have the Holy Spirit. How is it that our fellowship with the Father and the Son depends on doctrine? Remember 2 John, whoever abides in the doctrine of Christ has God. Whoever does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. How can this be? Does our salvation depend on how good at theology we are? Who then can be saved? How can our salvation depend on doctrine? John's answer is so beautifully simple. Because this doctrine can only be taught by the Holy Spirit. I think this is what he's saying. This doctrine of Christ. A human teacher, sure, a human teacher said it to you. But the reason you believe it and confess it, the reason it is knowledge deep down in your soul is not the work of a human teacher. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember when Peter made his confession, Jesus said, Matthew 16, he said to his disciples, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What did Jesus say? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my father who is in heaven. If you know who Christ is, it's only because the spirit of God has taught you. And if someone has tried to teach you about Jesus Christ and you still don't believe it, that's evidence the Holy Spirit has not taught you and you don't have the Holy Spirit. John, if you'll, if you'll indulge me for one more long reading, I'm sorry, this is thick, I know. At the end of 1 John, he lays this out in even more detail. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. The Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. He just is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. How much greater is the testimony that God gives to you? For this is the testimony of God, that He has borne concerning His Son. God bears witness in you about the Son. What? Blessed Holy Spirit. He communicates these things deeper than we even know. Verse 10, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God himself bore in you about the Son. 
How do we know that Jesus is divine and human? The Lord, the Christ who is the Savior. Ultimately, no matter where you first heard it or read it, ultimately, we believe it and confess it because of the Spirit of God. And so if anyone denies this doctrine of Christ, His divinity, His humanity, His Christship, His Lordship, that He is God the Savior, it must be that the Holy Spirit has not taught it. That must mean that person doesn't have the Holy Spirit. And church, since the Spirit is the one who unites us with the Father and the Son, it means we don't have the Father and the Son either. That's what he's saying. If this teaching abides in you, you will abide in the Father and the Son. But if it doesn't abide in you, how can you have the Father and the Son without the Spirit? How can you have the Spirit without this doctrine, without believing this doctrine? Before I finish, I want to clarify one thing because some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, I'm not sure anyone has ever taught me that Jesus is God, and so I'm not sure I ever believed it. Does that mean that this whole time I haven't had the Holy Spirit? Because I wasn't able to stand up and say, Jesus is truly human and truly divine. In every way, everything that it means to be divine, he was. In everything it means to be human, he was. If I can't articulate it that way, does that mean I haven't had the Spirit this whole time? Well, not necessarily. I want to ask a few questions. First question, did you ever hear the gospel? Did you ever hear the gospel? Has anyone ever told you that God so loved the world that he sent his son? Son. With God, he sent him to take on flesh, to die for your sins, to be raised from the dead. And that by trusting in Jesus, God's son, you will be forgiven your sins and be united with God. If no one has ever told you that, you're not a Christian. Being a Christian is our loving response to the love of God demonstrated in the gospel. And so if you haven't heard it, you can't be a Christian, but now you have heard it, so now you can be, and I hope you believe that, and I hope the Holy Spirit did something with even that just brief little snippet. But if someone did tell you that, if you have heard the gospel, let me ask you some more questions. When you trusted in the God that you heard about who saved you, were you also trusting in Jesus? Like, did you put faith in Jesus? Somebody said, God sent his son. Did you put faith in the son? That's kind of a thing you do toward someone who is divine, right? You had a response, almost as if deep down you knew he was divine all along, even if you couldn't articulate it that way. Did you begin to love Jesus? For what he did to save you? Did you call him Savior? Did you worship him? Did you adore him in your heart? If so, you have the Holy Spirit, because there's no way you could do that without the Holy Spirit. That experience in your heart, that experience and that expression, that response of worship, I believe that is a confession of the divinity of Christ. Even if you don't know how to say it the way the church has already said it. But in your heart, you really did confess the divinity of Christ because you worshiped him. If you have had that experience that I just talked about, the response to the gospel, and now you're hearing me say Jesus is divine and your response is, I don't think so. I don't think he's divine. Then here's my next question. Why have you been worshiping him this whole time? If he is not divine. And I want to suggest that if you have been worshiping someone who is not divine, you have broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You have broken the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you've robbed God of the worship due to him alone 
by worshiping what you thought was not God. The Bible word for that is blasphemy. If anyone does not confess that Jesus is the Christ who came from heaven and took on flesh, I've been praying for you that the Spirit would use this text, this message, to convince you otherwise. It doesn't mean that we don't have questions. This is one of the great... The divinity of Christ and the Trinity are the two great mysteries of the Christian faith. And you can lose your mind thinking about these things too much. So it doesn't mean we understand it perfectly. It doesn't mean we don't have questions. It doesn't mean that it's easy to believe, much less explain. But it does mean that when you think about Jesus, your thoughts are worshipful. You adore him as God. And this is key. You humble yourself before him as the divine king. When the spirit reveals to you the glory of Jesus Christ, as he does in our gatherings week in and week out. This is one of the reasons we come together. The spirit has chosen in the community of faith to reveal to our hearts things about Jesus Christ that make us worship him. And he does it through the others sitting here, and he does it through the songs we sing, and he does it through the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is here and active. And this is his main task, to bring your heart to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son. And when he does that, when he reveals to you the glory of Christ, you will be able to sing with all your heart, Jesus, you are all to us, which is what we're about to sing. The praise team can come on up. We're going to begin our singing by asking God to abide in us, stay with us, Lord, and then we will confess the divinity of Christ in song as we exalt him on our highest praise, which is our privilege to do. Let's stand and do that. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkest event, Lord, with me abide, when Precious corn. 
cornerstone, sure foundation. You are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. So let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us. Only Son of God sent from of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. You're all to us. Let's pray together before we go. Father God in heaven, it has been great to be here this morning. Father, to, um, to show you worship and praise for who you are. And God, we, we face a new week. And we know that we don't face this new week alone. God, you are with us. Your Holy Spirit is inside of us. And so, Father, we face boldly this coming week. And we know that we are not alone. God, there are those here that that are sick, those who are in need, Father, those who are sick spiritually and physically and emotionally. And God, we pray for healing on their behalf. God, we uh, pray for our families. Uh, we pray for those uh, marriages here. God, we pray for those who are single. We pray for our teens and our youth. God, we lift all of us up before you because we know that we can't do this life without you. God, we are grateful to you for the forgiveness that we get every day through the blood of your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the hope that we have through Jesus. We thank you for the joy that we have through your son. And God, we thank you for the way that you love us through him. May we go in peace, God, and may we go with a spirit of contentment. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.